Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today, I'm heading back into Matt Powell territory. He recently released a video titled Why I Believe in Noah's Ark. I don't expect to get anything groundbreaking, but being Powell, I'd be very surprised indeed if we didn't get a new bit of hilarious idiocy. So let's skip the preamble and get straight to the Powell. In the center of the United States, we find hundreds and hundreds of dinosaur graveyards. Each one of these dots that you see represents a graveyard that contains sometimes hundreds of thousands of fossils. So we're only 13 seconds in and I've already gone on a journey. I recognize that map from a video I did back in 2019 responding to Genesis Apologetics, so I'll leave a card to that. But before accusing Matt of just stealing their map, I noticed that it looks a little bit different. So I tried to hunt down the one that is identical to Matt's, and long story short, I doubt very much that Matt actually put it together on his own rather than just taking it from another creationist organization, but I didn't find an exact match. I did, however, find that this style of map is made using the Paleobiology Database Navigator, which which is a nifty little tool that lets you look at every documented fossil find, filter by age or taxa, and even provides a nice little visualization of what position the continents were in during whatever time period you're looking at. Anyway, what's notable about the map that Matt is showing us is that it's got fossil finds from three different time periods labeled. The purple dots are from the Triassic, blue is Jurassic, and green is Cretaceous. Matt wants us to believe that all of the fossils there were buried as a part of Noah's Flood. but. For some reason, the purple dots are always older than the blue dots, which are always older than the green dots. And that's including in several locations where there are green, purple, and blue dots overlapping, indicating one location with fossil finds from each of the three periods represented. Now, if all of these animals coexisted and lived in the same places at the same time, then why is there such a clear divide between them? We would expect them to be completely jumbled up, not perfectly sorted. But wait, there's more! It gets worse for Matt. You see, he's just got dinosaur fossils plotted out there. We're trying to show evidence of a global flood here. Why would it matter where just the dinosaurs were buried? Shouldn't we look at all the fossil finds? That is something that you can do with the Paleobiology Database Navigator, and this is what a map of North America looks like when we turn off the dinosaur filter and look at all time periods. Funny thing is, Everything is still perfectly sorted by geologic age. And this is more than just looking at individual fossils. This isn't saying that we don't find Triceratops fossils in Jurassic layers. This is entire ecosystems represented in the fossil record, with zero overlap. If these fossils were all buried as a result of Noah's flood, you'd expect them to be jumbled up, but they just aren't. Many of these dinosaurs are found fully intact, and we've discovered that they died from choking on mud. So, fun fact about the death pose, but aside from the fact that it's not fully understood, so to say conclusively that it's a result of them choking on mud is misleading to say the least, but one of the hypotheses about the cause of this posture is that it's a result of the decay process. As the body of the animal decays slowly over a period spanning several years, the formation of adipose here, a waxy substance that forms during the decomposition of dead bodies in moist environments, protects the body from too much damage and decay while it is slowly buried. So. Yes, one hypothesis is that the death pose is the result of brain damage to the animal during its death throes, and that would be consistent with drowning or choking on mud, but other hypotheses show that such a pose can actually be indicative of a relatively slow burial, spanning 40 years to perhaps even a century, which to be clear is still a very rapid burial as far as geologic timescales are concerned, but it's much slower than we would expect from the creationist model where all the fossils were buried in a single year-long event. And so you have to ask the question, what could cause a tsunami so big that it would encompass the entire United States, or at least half of the United States, and bury hundreds of thousands of creatures and sea life together all in one large event? Aside from your presupposition that fossils are the result of Noah's flood, what makes you think that it happened in one large event rather than a bunch of small events? Local floods happen, you know. Several of them per year, in fact. As do mudslides, landslides, earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, and just, you know, organisms dying normally in their environments and then being buried by normal depositional processes, which we can still see happening today. 
And yes, it is a true statement that environments involving water are more prone to fossilization. But hey, here's a fun little fact for you. The middle of North America was covered by a large inland sea during the late Cretaceous, and if we look at the two maps side by side, we see that most Cretaceous fossils come from locations that would have been underwater during that time period. Funny how when you recreate past environments, it turns out that the environments most conducive to the formation of fossils are the ones in which we find the most fossils, isn't it? Almost like geologists and paleontologists know what they're doing. There is no other option other than a global flood. Maybe not if you think they all formed in one single event, but the non-global flood option is much more plausible, that they formed in small-scale events of the same kind that we still see happening today. And as a nice little bonus, that also explains why they are perfectly sorted like they are. Like, it's not just that it fits better with the fact that they are sorted, it actually explains why that would be. While every attempt that creationists have made to explain the sorting of the fossils is not only very obvious post hoc rationalization, but is completely laughable. In one model, the fossil organisms are separated by elevation, with the lowest elevation organisms being the first to fossilize, and the highest elevation organisms being the last. Which doesn't really do a great job of explaining how we can have bottom-dwelling marine organisms fossilized in more recent strata than birds and pterosaurs. In another, organisms are hydrologically sorted by bone density, which is not even close to being true. Ankylosaurus is quite possibly the densest of all the dinosaurs with its heavy plate armor, and yet it is exclusively found in the youngest of the layers that contain non-avian dinosaurs, being exclusive to the late Cretaceous. And then we have pterosaurs, which were about as dense as modern birds, but were never found in the same layers as anything even remotely approaching a modern bird. So while hydrologic sorting sounds plausible if you just hear the explanation of how denser objects sink faster than less dense ones, if you spend just a few minutes looking into which animals are found where and how dense these animals were relative to each other, it turns out that the fossils are not even close to being sorted by density. I'm your density. The last of the creationist ideas is based on mobility. The more able a creature is to move, the less likely it is to be caught in the rising floodwaters. Hence why birds and land vertebrates are found exclusively in the higher layers, while animals that are aquatic are in all layers. Because if you combine it with the elevation thing, some aquatic animals would have been in mountains and lakes at high elevations. You know, like the very common mountain-dwelling whales that are only found in layers younger than dinosaur-bearing layers. This also doesn't explain the clear delineations. Why is it that Apatosaurus is only found in late Jurassic layers, while Alamosaurus is only found in late Cretaceous layers? Surely they are similar animals who had similar habitats. Why such a vast separation between them in the rock layers? They even had overlapping ranges, with Alamosaurus being found in between Mexico and Utah, and Apatosaurus being found from Wyoming down to New Mexico, with several fossil sites yielding specimens of both sauropods. Again, to use the handy-dandy fossil specimen tool that Matt helped me find, the green dots are Alamosaurus, the blue dots are Apatosaurus, and the turquoise dots are where both were found. Two animals that fill the same ecological niche, have similar mobility and similar bone density, sometimes with specimens being found in the same location, but always with the Alamosaurus being found in younger rock than the Apatosaurus. Why is it so consistent if they all died in the same event? And in order to get a fossil, you have to have rapid burial. Yes, and by rapid, we mean before all the organic matter can decay away, which, as it turns out, could be upwards of a century according to the study that I referenced on dinosaur death poses earlier. And while I'd agree that in most cases fossils are probably made in events that do bury the organism pretty much immediately, like mudslides or volcanic eruptions, it's not like it's completely unheard of for there to be evidence that an organism was not buried immediately upon death. There are plenty of fossils that show evidence of scavenger activity. In fact, there are instances where we've figured out a pretty detailed picture of the ecology of a particular location based on nothing but evidence from scavenger activity left on the fossils from vertebrates and arthropods, as well as the marks left on these fossils by various plant roots as they grew. If these organisms all died in a worldwide flood, that would have killed everything else in the same environment as them at the same time. This would be impossible if that were the case. Scavengers wouldn't have had time to scavenge. Plants wouldn't have had enough time to grow roots that make enough of an impact to actually mark the bones of dead animals. They all would have died together. But as it turns out, there is an abundance of evidence of scavenging activity on these fossils. Ergo, no flood. And so that's the only explanation why we would find these dinosaurs buried and preserved in the positions that we find them. It's the only explanation if you didn't bother to do some very cursory research into other explanations. 
and if you ignore the possibility of a bunch of local events rather than assuming it was one worldwide event. Because even creationists agree with what order the rock layers were laid down in, they just disagree with the time frame. So creationist geologists will all agree that Cretaceous rock layers are younger than Jurassic rock layers. They just think that it was a matter of days or months rather than years that separate them. But this leaves them with the problem that I outlined earlier about some animals being found in the same locations, but always temporally isolated from each other. There is no mechanism that adequately explains that from a creationist perspective. And within some of these dinosaurs, we find preserved blood cells. No, we don't. We find preserved soft bits that are morphologically similar to red blood cells, but even if they are made of the original material, they have undergone several chemical processes that allowed them to be preserved that change their molecular makeup to a point where morphology is basically their only similarity to actual red blood cells. Now, the blood cells were analyzed by different scientists, and we found that they actually died from drowning. Okay, I can't find a study with that exact picture, even a reverse Google image search has failed me here, but when I searched for the caption, Triceratops branching canals with blood clots, I found a paper that had similar images and made similar claims, published by Cambridge University Press. As I read through the paper, my skeptic senses began tingling. In this paper that ostensibly shows blood clots in the blood vessels of a Triceratops horn, the authors spend an inordinate amount of time explaining why they don't think cross-linking catalyzed by iron from red blood cells is an adequate explanation for the preservation of soft tissues through deep time, and when it finally got to the actual topic of the paper, the blood clots, the section was written as though it was meant to be a rebuttal of Mary Schweitzer's work in figuring out how soft tissues could be preserved that long, rather than just explaining what it is that they found. This sort of thing is not entirely unheard of in scientific literature, but generally when that happens, the title of the paper would indicate that it's a paper that is specifically attempting to counter a previous paper's findings, rather than presenting itself as though it's novel research all on its own. And when I got to the end of the paper, it finishes with a list of questions that seem worded specifically to give creationist material to use. Are the crosslinks suggested by this one paper sufficient to stabilize vessels over deep time? What about all the amino acids I just found that aren't crosslinked? And, you know, stuff like that. And again, this isn't enough on its own to just dismiss this paper and its findings, but a few weeks ago I went over the most current literature on dinosaur soft tissue, and I hadn't come across this paper or any paper by this particular author, a guy by the name of Mark Armitage. Now that I've named the guy, I'm sure at least some of you know where I eventually ended up here. But for those of you who don't, I'm not going to spoil it quite yet. So anyway, I found this on the Cambridge Press website, and they list all the papers that have cited this paper there. There are a grand total of four of them, which seems wrong for such a groundbreaking discovery. For comparison, sticking to the same subject matter, there was a paper published in 2021 that purported to show that the soft tissue being observed in dinosaur fossils was actually an artifact of the type of microscopy they were using. That paper has been cited 22 times so far, according to Google Scholar, including by a paper that is of the kind that I mentioned earlier, where the title makes it clear that they are refuting the first paper's results, and with plenty of scientific snark scattered throughout the abstract. This paper on blood clots in a triceratops horn, though? It's been around for a year longer than the one that was cited 22 times, and it's got ramifications that are just as important as that one. And it's been cited a grand total of four times according to the Cambridge website, but eight times according to Google Scholar. But it gets worse here. When we look at these eight citations, five of the eight are other papers by Armitage, one is a blog post on creationunfolding.com, no idea what that's doing on Google Scholar, and the other two are the same paper but in different languages. It's a paper that investigated the use of recurrent keywords in molecular paleontology papers in an effort to provide researchers with potential keywords that they could use to make their papers easier to find. So it wasn't with regards to what Armitage actually found in his paper, it was just looking at what keywords he used. Now, it's not unusual for an author to cite their previous papers, especially when they are building on their previous research, but it is a bit of a red flag if they are the only ones citing it. But the one paper that wasn't self-referential here was a paper on the subject of molecular paleontology. On that note, I mentioned that this paper was published by Cambridge, but I didn't say which journal it was published in. They publish hundreds of scientific journals. It was published in Microscopy Today. It's an interesting choice, given that the subject is very heavily related to paleontology, and that Cambridge publishes the Journal of Paleontology. 
Okay, okay, but you know, maybe I'm just being a little bit too nitpicky, because you know, Microscopy Today is a legit journal, and this is dealing with the detection of blood clots while using UV autofluorescence microscopy, so it's not entirely inappropriate. But there are enough red flags here that I wanted to learn more about who this Mark Armitage guy even is. So after learning that if you don't include his middle initial in a Google search you'll only ever find the real estate agent Mark Armitage, I finally found a brief biography of him. So. What are his qualifications here? He has a Bachelor of Science in Education from Liberty University. Okay, that's another couple of red flags. A BS in education does not a paleontologist make, and Liberty University is a hardcore Christian institution, so I could see him coming out of there with some creationist sympathies, but at least they're accredited, right? But that's not where his education stops. He also has a Master of Science in Biology. He got that under Richard Lumsden, who got his PhD from Rice University and was the Dean of Tulane University's graduate program. But that's another red flag, actually. I've never seen anyone list who they studied under as a part of their master's program, especially not before listing what school they got their degree from. So what school was it? The Institute for Creation Research. Big fucking yikes there, bro. He then went back to Liberty University for an EDS degree in science education, and is apparently currently a doctoral candidate. So the dude's only science-related credentials are either specific to the teaching of science, or came from a creationist diploma mill. And even the one he got from the diploma mill specializes in parasitology. He has zero credentials related to paleontology. Now, I'm fairly deep into this guy now, that's what she said, so I'm not going to go into great detail on the rest, but there are a couple more things worth mentioning. He claims to have been fired from California State University for finding soft tissue in a Triceratops horn, which would be really weird since nobody else researching dinosaur soft tissue has been fired for it. Notably, Armitage found a lot of soft tissue in the horn that he examined, and nobody is contesting that. What is contested, however, is whether or not it was even a Triceratops horn. There is only one single picture of the fossil in situ, and it is partially obscured in that picture. In the paper where he published the original finding of the horn, he got its length wrong, reporting it to be 58 centimeters long, when the in situ picture, which has a tape measure out, shows it to be at least 83 centimeters long. He's also non-specific about where it was found, but with a bit of digging, pun intended, fellow YouTuber Gutsit Gibbon was able to pinpoint it to a private ranch owned by a creationist who only allows other creationists to excavate on their property. The horn has never been examined by an actual paleontologist, no cast was ever made of it, and they broke it during transport. No pictures were provided showing the whole horn after the break, all of the pictures are of just individual pieces, and they're taken from angles that make it impossible to verify that they're even from the same fossil. All of this is quite damning. I don't even need to mention the fact that professional paleontologists have frequently confused the horns of ancient bisons, specifically bison latifrons, with triceratops horns. Whoops, I just did that, didn't I? Sorry. Notably though, if it were a bison latifrons horn, it would probably be a maximum of about 200,000 years old, potentially being as young as 20,000 years. Meaning that you would expect to find significantly more soft tissues in it than in a dinosaur fossil. And he found significantly more soft tissue in it than any confirmed dinosaur soft tissue find. There is more to the story here, I'll leave a card to Gutsick Gibbon's video dealing with Armitage in more detail than I just did, but suffice it to say for my purposes that someone with zero expertise in paleontology is incredibly unlikely to have made a groundbreaking discovery for the field of paleontology without enlisting the help of an actual paleontologist. So bringing it back to what Matt was saying, he did not show that a triceratops drowned, he found a blood clot that could be indicative of drowning in what was probably a bison horn, but we can't know for certain because he won't let any experts in fossil identification anywhere near the fossil in order to, you know, identify it. Oh, also, the original fossil find was published in the journal Acta Histochemica, which focuses on cell and tissue biology, not paleontology, and has a low impact factor of 2.5 and an average citations per article of 4. For comparison, the extremely reputable journal Cell currently has an impact factor of 64.5, with an average of 102 citations per article. Admittedly, that's very high even for reputable journals. Something more run-of-the-mill would be the journal Current Biology, which has an impact factor of 9.2, with 12.1 citations per article. Of course, these metrics are not the sole determining factors of journal quality, but it's just another red flag that he's publishing his findings in unrelated journals that have unimpressive metrics. Okay, I promise I'm done with this Armitage guy now. Back to Powell! And so, 
Once again, you have to ask the question, what could cause waves so huge that they would hit in the center of the United States, all the way from the oceanic coast? Why do you think that the only way for an animal to drown in the middle of the United States is for a wave from the ocean to have hit it? Have you not heard of lakes and rivers? Those are things that exist all throughout the U.S. Now, I know you probably deny the existence of the Western Interior Seaway, but it did exist, and it was possible for animals to drown in it without a tsunami from the Pacific. Noah's Flood is the explanation for these things. In fact, it is the only explanation. <sighs> I don't know that it even rises to the level of explanation, especially given the fact that you're describing a flood that is so violent that it would be capable of forming giant tsunamis that can cover entire continents. Noah's little boat wouldn't have stood a chance in that environment. I'm sure you can say that God protected it or whatever, but if you're just going to invoke magic at this point, why bother even looking for a scientific confirmation of the flood? Just be consistent and use magic as the explanation for everything. And this is why we find whales perfectly preserved on top of mountains. No, 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 no. You see, according to Answers in Genesis, whales are on mountains because that's where they lived before the Flood. Because the organisms that are exclusive to younger layers lived at higher elevations. Of course, we all know the real reason they're found on mountains sometimes is because of tectonic activity. A lot of mountain ranges are made up of material that used to be ancient seafloor, so stuff that lived in the sea ended up on top of mountains. Now, how could whales have possibly gotten to the top of certain mountains? Tectonic activity. You should know this by now, Matt. It's an easy one, even for you. This is also why we find whales in the desert. Or, hear me out, the desert wasn't always a desert. Whale Valley in Egypt is quite possibly the most important site where we have discovered fossil whales, or rather proto-whales. These fossils have shown us several species of obvious cetacean ancestors in the process of losing their legs. And they're found in rock that was deposited in a marine environment. Environments change, Matt. Your incredulity at this fact does not negate it. This is why we find clams that are in the closed position that were catastrophically buried on top of Mount Everest, 29,000 feet above sea level. Uh, creationists always go for Mount Everest. I, mean, I guess that's because it's the most impressive. Probably the same reason why they only showed us the map of the U.S. with dinosaur fossils instead of all the fossils. Dinosaurs are more attention-grabbing. But fossil clams have been found on several mountain ranges, for the same reason as the whales. The mountaintops that they're found on are made up of material that used to be ancient seafloor. As to their closed position, Matt doesn't explain this, which provides us with some evidence that he's just making these videos for people who already agree with him, because a creationist will likely already be familiar with that argument, but someone who's not elbow-deep in creationist garbage won't necessarily know what he's getting at. I mean, either that or Matt is just inept when it comes to communicating, which, you know what, yeah, let's, let's go with ineptitude here. That fits Matt better than, you know, being clever about who his target audience is. Anyway, this argument goes something like this. When a clam dies, its muscles relax, so its shell opens. Anyone who cooks clams or mussels will be familiar with this. If it's open and doesn't close when you tap its shell, it's dead and they go bad very quickly, so don't even try cooking it, just discard it. But the thing is, fossil clams are found in the closed position all the time, mountains or no, because it's relatively easy to push a dead clam's shell closed. And as Matt so helpfully pointed out earlier in this very video, rapid burial is a key factor in fossilization. Bury a dead clam in some sediment, and the weight of the sediment is likely to push its shell closed. Actually, closed clam shells can be valuable fossils, as they can provide a record of fine sediments and even small plants and animals that get trapped in their shells before they are force closed. In sum, we find clams that are closed even though clams open when they die, because heavy sediment is heavy. Tricky, I know. But also, I don't see how this even is an argument. Creationists say things need to be buried in order to be preserved in the fossil record, and so do real scientists. So everyone agrees that an organism is more likely to be preserved if it gets buried in a bunch of heavy sediment material during or shortly after its death. Ergo, finding clams with closed shells is expected either way. We also find trees going through all of the different layers of supposed geologic time. Yeah, we do. Now stop to think about that for a moment. We don't find animals spanning multiple layers, we find trees. Or, you know, tree-like lycopods to be more precise. They span multiple layers because they were big tree-like plants that could survive some types of deposition happening around their bases, and could even continue standing for potentially centuries after their death. The environments that are indicated by the rock layers that they are found in 
always suggest places where deposition would be going on fairly regularly throughout the plant's life, with occasional sudden events. So, for instance, in a swampy area that would have an accumulation of dead plant matter at the base of the lycopod, with the occasional levee breach bringing in sediments from flooding. We see the same thing happening in swamps today. In fact, measuring how much peat has accumulated around the base of saplings is one way that researchers determine the accumulation rate of peat in peat bogs. And in the case of these lycopods, the layers that they pass through all show signs of other organisms going about their normal lives. There are layers with roots in them, footprints, reptiles that are fossilized after falling into hollowed out tree stumps, and more. So tell me, Matt. If they span multiple layers because of a global flood, how did plants begin growing in those layers with root systems showing that they weren't just swept in already dead in the flood, but germinated and grew there in place? How are there footprints in those layers indicating that animals were just walking around normally if those layers were all swept in violently during the flood? And more importantly, why are creationists so dead set on using these fossils as proof of the flood when the non-flood explanation has been well documented since the 1860s? You know, Kent Hovind once accused me of having my science out of date by about a century because I referenced embryology as evidence for evolution. And to him, that meant that I was relying on the drawings of Ernst Haeckel, which were later found out to have been not entirely accurate, with Haeckel maybe having exaggerated certain features to support his favorite idea of embryology, recapitulation theory, which was the idea that the embryo literally becomes each animal in its evolutionary ancestry during its development, and that idea has been soundly refuted. There's also some question as to whether or not Haeckel actually did do these exaggerations, he didn't have access to all the embryos exactly, he was copying other people's drawings, and even when he did have access to them, the technology at the time was such that he couldn't really see them quite as clearly as we can today with our fancy microscopes and shit. But that's all tangential. I was not actually relying on Haeckel's work, I was relying on more modern work, but here we have Hoven's acolyte, Matt Powell, using evidence for the flood that was refuted as being evidence for the flood 155 years ago. The terminology has been updated since John Dawson wrote his explanation in the book in 1868, but the explanation remains the same, and he made the same observations that I have pointed out here, that there is evidence in the layers that buried the tree trunks of life carrying on as normal, with plants taking root and growing and animals crawling about, something that would not be possible if they spanned multiple layers because of the flood. And less creationists accuse Dawson of being an atheist pushing deep time and evolution as a way to explain away God. Let's quote the last sentence of his book on Acadian geology where we find this explanation, shall we? Patient observation and thought may enable us in time better to comprehend these mysteries, and I think we may be much aided in this by cultivating an acquaintance with the maker and ruler of the machine, as well as with his work. People think that these layers are millions of years of different time zones. Nope. Creationists keep claiming that, but they never back up their claims. And I know Matt watches my videos. Hi Matt, you're a big fan, I know. You should probably support me on Patreon, patreon.com slash vicerhino. Or donate to Project Share, go to share.vicerhino.com. Go ahead. I dare ya. Anyway, he at least watches the videos where I cover him. And I have corrected him on this point before, so this is him lying again. Yes, Matt, I'm calling you a liar. If you have a tree that was placed there at the time of the formation of the layers around it, that means that the layers are not millions of years of different ages. Right. In this case, they're in the order of decades and centuries. Just because some layers take millions of years to form does not mean that all layers take millions of years to form. We also find coal deposits that are over 100 feet thick. Now coal comes from vegetation and different organisms that have been smashed together between sediments. How in the world are you going to get a coal deposit that's over a hundred feet thick. I don't know, man. That sounds like more of a problem for creationism than anything. Do you have any idea how many organisms would have had to have been alive on the planet all at the same time in order for such large coal beds to have formed in a single year-long flood? I ran the numbers in a previous video for organic limestone rather than coal, but adding in the coal would make it worse, so I'm comfortable reusing those numbers. In order for the amount of limestone we see on the Earth to have been formed by organisms that were all alive at the exact same time, you would need 23 Earth-sized planets with their entire surface areas, oceans included, completely filled with Empire State buildings stuffed full of hard-shelled animals like snails. This is such a ridiculously large number of animals that I could have been wrong by an order of magnitude and there still wouldn't be enough room on the Earth. 
And remember, that's just the limestone. Coal is, once again, made up of organic matter. So we've got entire planets full of animals living together to make the limestone when the flood hits. How much more surface area do we need dedicated to the plants living together to make the coal? No idea, and I'm not gonna even bother back of the enveloping it right now, but given that Matt knows that coal is very highly compressed plant matter, he also knows that it would take a lot more plants than would fit into the same area while they were alive. This shows us that the pre-flood world was extremely lush. There was a lot of vegetation. I'll show you extremely lush. Wrong kind of lush. Anyway, extremely lush with such a lot of vegetation, which, yeah, that's what lush means, unless we're talking about the booze, that it probably took up three or four planets of lush vegetation to produce that amount of coal, not to mention the oil and natural gas. There was large animals, dinosaurs, that were all buried together with trees and with different organic materials and creating massive, massive amounts of coal. Uh, no. The majority of the coal on the planet is found in rocks that are dated to the Carboniferous, before the dinosaurs evolved. Another time of major coal formation was around the time of the extinction of the non-avian dinosaurs. Both of these time periods were notable for having pretty active mountain-forming tectonic activity, which resulted in the warm, swampy environments that produced peat being buried quite deep, and subject to a lot of pressure. So while we do find plenty of fossils in and around coal beds, they usually aren't dinosaurs. But this brings me to an important point here. Coal beds are where paleontologists can learn a lot about ancient ecosystems, specifically because of how they are formed. Frequently, a coal bed will be sandwiched between non-coal sedimentary layers. And in such situations, what we see is that coal-producing areas tend to go through cycles. It'll start with a dry tropical forest, which expands as the global temperatures lower, causing the ice caps to expand and lower the sea level. When the Earth begins warming, the amount of rain in the lower latitudes drastically increases, turning the dry forests into peat-producing swamps. Then, relatively rapidly from a geologic perspective, the ice caps begin melting, causing a rise in sea level, which floods the swamp with salt water, killing the forest, and bringing in sediment that compresses the peat, beginning the formation of coal, before the cycle begins again. Several of these cycles are often found in single coal beds, and each cycle is estimated to last between 100,000 and 400,000 years. How does that work if it was all made in one single global flood that lasted just over one year? Why do you have to ignore the ecology that we've discovered by studying coal in order to just say, coal's compressed plants, therefore it was the flood? Now, mountains themselves are great proof of Noah's flood. If you look at the layers of some of these mountains, you'll notice that all of the layers are bent. Not all of the layers, no, but yes, bent layers do exist. Hell, layers exist that have been completely tilted vertically. I took pictures of such layers while I was visiting the Garden of the Gods in Colorado Springs. They're still straight, mind you, but that ain't how the original deposition happened. You cannot bend hard rock. Quite the contrary, cold hard rocks can and do bend. That's actually what causes earthquakes. I can actually squeeze the sides of this rock together, and when I let go, it comes back again. When plates move, they can bend elastically, like huge springs, and then when the earthquake happens, boom, they release that elastic energy and turn it into kinetic energy and into heat and into the waves record our seismometers. If rocks were entirely inelastic, earthquakes wouldn't be as violent as they are. It would just be a bunch of tiny micro-earthquakes happening all the time as the tectonic plates move. But because rocks are at least somewhat elastic, and able to bend, earthquakes are much more explosive, because they happen when tectonic plates move farther than the rock's ability to bend, causing them to snap. That means that all of these layers were moist when they were laid down, and then when the plates were moving, they were bent upwards as all of them were pliable, and all of them solidified together in one event. No, that's not how it happened. If that were how it happened, then we'd expect to see a bunch of intrusions between the layers where this still soft material started mixing together, with neighboring layers contaminating each other with their own material. And that's if I even start with the assumption that a global flood would even form layers like this in the first place. An assumption that we know is wrong, because we know what flood deposition looks like, and it doesn't look like what we see in the rock layers. 
well, except for the layers that actually are flood deposition, but the fact that those can be identified as being different from the other depositional environments is kind of my whole point here. You can't have a layer of flood deposition that is distinct from other kinds of deposition if all of the deposition happened in one single flood event. It would all be the same layer. Anyway, to address the bent rock thing, even though cold rock can bend, that's not actually what causes these layers. They are bent when they are deep beneath the surface of the Earth, being under extreme pressure and quite a bit warmer than on the surface. And what happens to brittle materials like rock when they get warmer? They become more ductile, that is, more able to bend without breaking. To demonstrate, I'll turn once again to my crayon example. When a crayon is at room temperature, it'll bend a little, but too much pressure will cause it to snap. But if you give it a nice warm bath at about 45 degrees Celsius, it's not quite warm enough to melt it, but it becomes much more ductile, allowing it to bend almost in half without breaking. When allowed to cool, it is now solidified in that position. It is just as brittle as it was before its warm bath, but with a bend in the middle that would have been impossible to achieve at room temperature. Same with the rocks. The bends look extreme because we're used to seeing cold rocks that couldn't possibly bend like that. But when it's under different conditions, it behaves differently. That's a shocker, I know. According to humanists, the plates on the Earth have only been moving about one to two inches per year. According to humanists? Bloody hell, Matt, you don't even know what a humanist is, do you? According to the American Humanist Association, humanism is a progressive philosophy of life that, without theism or other supernatural beliefs, affirms our ability and responsibility to lead ethical lives of personal fulfillment that aspire to the greater good. Humanists typically try to make sure their views are science-based when possible, which means that yes, humanists probably would agree with the statement that the tectonic plates move towards and away from each other at an average rate of approximately 1.5 centimeters per year, with the fastest moving approximately 5 centimeters per year, numbers that don't quite match up with what Matt says but aren't far enough off to quibble over, aside from pointing out that creationists are often quite sloppy with the little details that don't matter, which should lead one to heighten skepticism regarding the bigger details that actually do matter, to come to think of it. But anyways, the statement about the tectonic plates moving would be more accurately attributed to geologists or geophysicists. Hell, even just general scientists would have been better than humanists. And these plates slowly create the mountains as one slides under the other plate. Yeah, sorta, kinda, yeah. Obviously there's more to it than that. But yes, yeah, you know what, Matt? This is the most correct thing you've said in this video, so go ahead and give yourself a little pat on the back, okay? Well done! Yes. Father? Ah, there he is! Anyway, yes, the mountains are created by tectonic activity, and this is determined using the creationist favorite method, direct observation. We can measure how fast mountain ranges in geologically active areas are growing, so this isn't just some wildly speculative endeavor. This is such basic stuff that not even creationist geologists will deny it. This could not have happened. These mountain ranges that we see would have shattered and broken. They would have eroded flat. You cannot bend hard rock. No, Matt, that's not how it works. Sure, mountain formation due to tectonic plates crumpling can and does cause some of these bent layers, but again, that happens when they are deep below the surface of the Earth, much warmer than they are when we see them. It also happens over long periods of time. Consistent pressure applied over a long time is another way that relatively brittle objects can be bent. That's actually how woodworkers bend wood. They create a form that will leave the wood in the shape that they want, and then apply an even pressure to the wood, slowly increasing it so that it will mold to the form without breaking, and then let it sit clamped to the form anywhere from several hours to several days. After which, if all goes well, they will have pieces of wood that are bent in exactly the shape of the form. And if you heat the wood with steam first, you can get even more extreme bends, far beyond what would normally be possible. You're trying to draw scientific conclusions using your intuition, but intuition is shaped by personal experiences, and I very much doubt that you have had personal experiences that would give you reliable intuition about the behavior of rocks buried deep inside the earth at high temperatures. All of these rocks that we see on these mountains were all soft and moist at the time of their formation. That's what she said. And that's why they're all perfectly bent many times. And you can see these beautiful photos of mountain ranges that show that they were created by a catastrophic flood and not millions of years of geological time. So, fun fact, you seem to be agreeing that the mountains were formed through tectonic activity, which probably makes you the type of creationist who thinks that tectonic plates were moving really, really fast during Noah's flood. Well, 
In the video that I referenced earlier, the one where I recognized the graphic that Matt borrowed from Genesis Apologetics, I calculated the amount of energy that would be released in order for the tectonic plates to move as much as creationists need them to, and it worked out to being the equivalent of 23.1 billion Hiroshima bombs per day. And while I'm sure that there were several issues with my back-of-the-envelope calculation, this is where John Baumgartner's paper comes in. If you're not familiar, he's a creationist geophysicist, and one who has actually published a few times in reputable journals like Nature. He determined that, in order to move the tectonic plates by the amount required by the Flood, the mantle of the Earth must be heated, ironically, to allow for better deformation of the rock making up the mantle. Deformation here meaning the rock was bending. This is how the rocks bend, Matt. Which would allow for the tectonic plates to move faster. The mantle's the layer of the Earth between the crust and the core, and it's actually mostly solid rock. Most people think of it as molten, but it's not. But despite being solid, it is hot enough that the rocks are soft and deform plastically, causing it to behave like a very viscous fluid. Baumgartner calculated that the heat increase necessary to decrease the viscosity of the mantle enough to allow for faster tectonic motion would result in a much hotter surface temperature than we observe today. The cooling rate of the rocks would need to be at least 100,000 times faster than they actually are. And Baumgartner, being a good creationist, doesn't see this as a reason to discard the young Earth model based on it not fitting the data that we observe. He instead concluded that this means that the laws of physics themselves must have been different during the Flood. Because nothing says unbiased examination of the data, like discarding the most basic and fundamental aspects of reality in order to twist reality into fitting your model. And that's why you find polystrata fossils connecting all the layers. That's why you find whales on mountains, clams on mountains, sea life on every single mountain on Earth. Nope. The creationist flood idea actually does a really shitty job of explaining all of those things, but they become incredibly easy to explain when using ordinary geology and paleontology that isn't religiously motivated. So what does that tell you? Why? Because the earth was flooded. Because by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. Because the world that then was, that was overflowed with water, perished. Just going to take a second to point out that these verses very much make it sound like the author believed in a flat earth that was propped out of the waters of the deep on pillars or foundations. You know, like the Bible consistently describes? I don't think Matt's a flat earther, but many of the authors of the Bible were, and it shows in their writings. And I think that the most powerful argument of all is the fact that we find 10 mile thick pieces of rock from the earth's crust that have been subducted rapidly. 500 miles down into Earth's hot molten mantle. So you think the subducted slabs should have heated up to equilibrium by now? Why do you think that? There are a number of reasons why they haven't yet. First, rock is an excellent insulator, so while the outside of the slabs are heating up, the interior is kept cool by the insulating properties of the rock itself. Second, remember the mantle is not liquid magma, it's also solid rock. This isn't like throwing a stone into a lava pool, it's more like cooking a steak by smushing it in between two already cooked and still hot steaks. Second, water. And by second I mean third, because apparently I can't count when I'm writing my scripts. The slabs subducting from the ocean floor contain a lot of water, and as they sink, they lose water. When this lost water mixes with other hot rock in the mantle, it lowers the melting temperature of that rock, resulting in its melting and buildup of pressure until you get an arc volcano. But by the same token, the water being lost by the subducting slab causes it to stay cooler for longer. This rock that we've found that's 10 miles thick, it's still cold even though it's surrounded by 5,000 degree molten rock. Okay, but did you listen to yourself when you described how big it is? It takes time for something that large to heat up. Quite a bit of time. But also, I've let this slide up until now, but when he says cold, what he means is colder than the surrounding rock. I mean, he probably thinks he means cold, like the same temperature as rocks at the surface, but it's actually just colder than the surrounding rocks. I've been unable to find the exact temperature of the slab that was being examined in the graphic that he showed, mainly because that paper uses a complicated calculation to turn temperatures into values between 0 and 1, with 0 0.52 being the equivalent of 1300 degrees Celsius. But in other papers researching lithosphere slabs in the mantle, we see that the rock of the mantle is about 1400 degrees Celsius, and the so-called cold slabs are around a thousand degrees. Also, there is one paper that didn't end up proving useful to me, but it had a list of highlights at the beginning, and I can't not point out that the first highlight from this paper is, and I cannot emphasize enough that this is a direct quote from a scientific paper, 
hot young slabs penetrate the lower mantle more easily than the cold old slabs. I mean, I thought I was on the wrong tab there for a second. Anyway, Matt is talking about rock that is at least a thousand degrees Celsius and saying it proves creation because it's still cold. Never mind that one of the ways we figured out that these slabs are tens of millions of years old is by calculating how long it would take for them to heat up to the temperature that they are today, given the temperature of the rock that they're being subducted into. They haven't reached thermal equilibrium yet, so they must be young. Typical creationist crap. Don't bother trying to actually understand it. It doesn't match my intuition, so it must be wrong. Now, could cold rock be sitting down in 5,000 degree temperatures for millions of years? If it's 10 miles thick, which I very much doubt given the inaccuracies and the other numbers that Matt's been using so far, then yes, as long as we're using cold in the relative sense, as in cold compared to the rock surrounding it, but still hot enough to melt your damn face off. There's no way. That's not physically possible. The only way you get cold rock that's 10 miles thick from the crust into the mantle of the Earth is from catastrophic breaking up of the plates and plates going under one another and literally getting subducted down. And if they're still cold, then it means that they have not been there that long. Dude, come on, you're literally describing how it actually happens and then just finishing it off with the equivalent of -uh with regards to their temperature, which you seem to think is actually cold rather than just still colder than the surrounding rock. You also seem to be working with the mistaken impression that the mantle is molten, which it is not. It's hot enough that rock at that temperature on the surface would be molten, but the extreme pressure it's under by, you know, having entire continents sitting on top of it, keeps it solid. Same thing with the subducting plates. This catastrophic event of the plates moving extremely fast, continental sprint, did in fact happen, and they were rapidly subducted, these 10 mile thick pieces of rock. And if that happened today, that would cause a global flood. What? No, obviously it would not. Rapid subduction would, if anything, expose the oceans to so much heat from the mantle in so short a time period that it would cause them to boil away. Oh, and that's not even getting into the energy released by the subduction itself, which, if I once again turn to the creationist geophysicist John Baumgartner, would have been enough to melt a layer of silicate rock 12 kilometers thick, or boil away a layer of water 25 kilometers deep over the entire surface of the Earth. For reference, the oceans currently have an average depth of about 3.7 kilometers, with a maximum depth just shy of 11 kilometers. So. Yeah, Noah would have had to fight with furiously boiling oceans in his little boat, according to calculations performed by a creationist. Okay, but creationists that hold to this rapid tectonic activity thing are often the same ones claiming that the topography of the Earth was much smoother in the past. So maybe if the ocean basins weren't so low and the mountains weren't so high, there would be more than 25 kilometers of water, thus offering some protection for Noah. Well, firstly, no, I doubt very much that having non-boiling water sitting on top of a 25 kilometer deep layer of water being vaporized would make things more survivable for Noah. But also, if the Earth were perfectly smooth, the water on it would only cover it to a depth of 2.5 kilometers, which, with some quick and dirty volume of sphere calculations and using the polar radius of the Earth to give the creationists their best shot, in order to raise the water level on a perfectly smooth Earth to 25 kilometers, that would require eight times the amount of water that is currently on the Earth. And that's just to get it to the point where all the water would boil away. If you want to get it past that point, you need even more. And because of the square cube law, every extra kilometer of depth that you add to the water covering the entire planet winds up with significantly more water than the previous kilometer of depth. Imagine, just for a minute, if you had a 10 mile thick piece of rock that was broken up from the crust, that subducted. That's how we even get earthquakes is by rocks and stuff sliding around and the crust of the earth sliding into different positions, that would have created another global flood if something like that happened today. No, if something like that happened today, in the way you're describing, it would cause the oceans to boil away and the land to melt. So I mean, yeah, I guess it would be a worldwide flood, but it would be a flood of lava, not water. These discoveries falsify Darwinian evolution. It shows that Darwin's book, their holy bible, the holy grail of, of Darwinian evolution, was a lie. Not even close. Slabs in the mantle have nothing to do with evolution. Evolution describes how organisms change over successive generations. It's got nothing to do with how recently a slab of oceanic crust subducted. 
but I wouldn't expect an acolyte of the Six Kinds of Evolution guy to understand why cold rocks in the mantle are unrelated to biological evolution. And that's even assuming that he was right about them being cold rocks or the mantle being magma rather than a solid. Like, seriously, if geologists discovered today that there were massive slabs of rock in the mantle that weren't just a bit cooler than the mantle itself, but were the same temperature as surface rocks, that would have massive implications for the field of geology, and it wouldn't have the slightest impact on evolution. The origin of species, by means of natural selection, was a lie. And in this video, we've had the chance, wonderful opportunity to see that God's word is the truth, and that God's word has trumped the origin of species and any other old earth perspective that's out there. How have we seen that? You quoted the Bible a grand total of one time, 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, which basically says that heaven is old, and the flat earth which stood out of the waters of the deep on pillars was flooded once. The one Bible passage you quoted is one that you wouldn't even agree with, and you have to go through mental contortions to pretend that it's not talking about a flat earth. And in order to conclude that the flood caused the dinosaur fossils, you had to avoid even mentioning the possibility of a bunch of local events spread out over time as an explanation, likely because you're aware that it's a much better explanation than an impossible worldwide flood, the physics of which would have boiled the oceans away. So that's it for this one. Today's comment of the day comes to us from Sean O'Nilbud, who says, A. Doctor Who is a children's show. B. Dicky bows are an emergent property of cognitive impairment. This was with reference to last week's video when I said that bow ties were cool, and I played Doctor Who clips of the Doctor saying that as well. And as you can see today, the bow tie isn't going anywhere. And yes, Doctor Who is a kid's show. Or at least that's how it was originally. The original concept was for an educational show where the Doctor would travel through time and experience events of historic significance in order to make the learning of history more entertaining for kids. The modern show, however, and when I say modern here I mean basically everything after, like, season two, has a very broad appeal with an audience base of millions of people, typically in the 12 to 40 year old age range. Put another way, it's a family show. You know, like Star Trek or something. But hey, that doesn't actually matter here. Call it a kids show if you want. I'll like what I like, regardless of the label that it gets. There are plenty of kids movies that I'm not ashamed about liking, like Monsters Inc. for instance is fantastic, I love it. The important thing here is that I actually kind of feel sorry for you. You seem to have decided that it's cool to dislike popular things, or that it's uncool to like things with particular labels attached to them. If you don't like Doctor Who, that's fine, but try not liking it for its substance rather than its label. Also, I find it funny that they've been subscribed to me for three years, but somehow haven't noticed that literally every single one of my videos opens with a Doctor Who reference. And yeah, point B was just a pretentious way of saying people who wear bow ties are stupid. Which, you know, is kind of a stupid thing to say. Like, are there people who are stupid that are known to wear bow ties? Absolutely. Tucker Carlson comes immediately to mind. But Erwin Schrodinger, of Schrodinger's cat fame, was undeniably very intelligent and frequently wore bow ties. And the obvious reference here is Bill Nye. I grew up watching Bill Nye. I have a great deal of respect for the man. He is an excellent science communicator with a genuine passion for what he does. And again, he is undeniably an intelligent person. And there's like two pictures of him without a bow tie on all of the internet. So yeah, I guess all this to say that deciding not to like something because it's not explicitly marketed to your demographic is a good way to make sure you miss out on a lot of enjoyment in life. And making judgments about people's intelligence based on their fashion sense is petty at best. Thanks for watching! I'll be back next Friday with more, but if you need to get your Rhino fix in before then, I live stream on my other channel, The Watering Hole, with Cirrus every Wednesday at 8.30 Eastern, and with my partner every Tuesday at 1 p.m. Eastern. Thanks to Tim Robertson for being my Patreon and Sponsorships Manager, and special thanks as always to my patrons, Kyle Norton, and all the rest, who are the hot young slabs that penetrate the mantle of my channel with ease. If you'd like to get inside me in a way that generates enough heat energy to boil the oceans, you can join us on Patreon for as little as a dollar per week over at Patreon com slash vice rhino, or by supporting the channel in one of the other methods that can be found at links.vicerhino.com. Com. Whatever, it's staying in. Which is also where you'll find links to my other projects. If for whatever reason you want to send me stuff, my P.O. Box address is in the description. See you next time!
she got another haircut, so now she's a rat dog again. An adorable rat dog, but a rat dog nonetheless. A waxy substance that forms during decomposition of... <laughs> right on the fucking microphone. God damn it, dog. He did not show that a Citraratops. Citra They're being subducted in two. Oh, I gotta breathe, Rhino, gotta breathe. Nope, 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 no face on the microphone, please. No pause on the microphone, please. Nope, no pause on the microphone. Oh, door faces, no, come on, give me, ah! Oh my God. You're not gonna be allowed to be in the video if you're gonna be like this. No, no, microphone not for you. You good, you good? Okay. 